and we are back with Morning Shot, and most importantly, with a friend of the channel, uh, Adam Van Sale, also known as Conscious Caracal, also known as Campaigns Officer for AfriForum, which is a great organization, and you should join them, of course. Adam, hello, and welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity, Roman. I know uh, uh, we've been uh, planning to have a chat uh, one of these days. So I think this is a good opportunity to not only talk about what's on the horizon, but some of the big ideas connected to it. Very much so. And speaking of on the horizon, uh, you've also now morphed into becoming a sort of documentary filmmaker. So a trailer for your new documentary hit YouTube, I think last week. It's called, excuse my bastardization of your language it's called self bestead which if you mm -hmm. google it means self-management but that sounds like some apple corporate <laughs> speak so tell me about this documentary and sort mm. of what is it Afroforum hopes to achieve through illuminating some of the themes in this particular mm. documentary that is going to hit today by the way and is linked in the description below yeah so uh, when it comes to the documentary or the title, uh, yes, the direct translation is a uh, self bestir uh, and that means self-management, but uh, not management in the corporate sense, management in the sense of you manage the affairs of your community, of your household, of your neighborhood, all of those uh, subsets of social associations. But more specifically, it's about the idea of community federalism. Now, community federalism, not in the sense of some massive centralized state that has a federal system but rather in the sense of uh, what it originally came to uh, how it came to the fore and that is uh, from the the minds of thinkers like uh, uh, Althusius who wrote about uh, concepts like subsidiarity where the essence of that is every uh, social associ every social association when it comes to the what who should be responsible for what the lowest or the, the most primary subset of that social association should be responsible for it. So uh, let's take an example. If a family can handle its safety and its defense, then it should have that it should take on that responsibility rather than the, the national police service or whatever. But if that family, the smallest uh, social association, according to uh, Althusius, cannot handle that responsibility, then it can be delegated to a level higher. A, le a higher level would not be the National uh, Police Service, but would rather be something like a neighborhood watch. So the whole idea of subsidiarity and more specifically community federalism is that the uh, responsibilities and uh, tasks that communities can do on a community level should be granted to them. It shouldn't be something that the centralized government uh, handles, it shouldn't be something that the government has a monopoly on. A last example would be, uh, let's say, power generation. According to this principle, the principle of community federalism, if a town or a neighborhood or even a household is able to generate its own electricity, it should not be forced to be tied to the, the, the national e electricity monopoly like ESCOM. It shouldn't be forced to have its destiny tied to that monopoly. It should be able, and it, and it can uh, generate its own electricity. So that's what AfriForum is, uh, is, is uh, communicating with this documentary, is specifically our state-proof plans for the future. And those state-proof plans for the future are specifically uh, centered around communities taking responsibility back from the government into their own hands. It's not a story of uh, uh, an easy story that people want to hear. It's not the nice prime T-bone steak. It's the vegetables that you're going to have to eat. That's the the message. But we're going to have to start doing it at some point. We're living in a, a, a state of decay. We have a state that's uh, completely uh, collapsing in so many regards. And uh, the Titanic is sinking. So you have two options. Either you can uh, just... Uh, go sit in the corner or, or you can either start building life rafts and take up the responsibility or you can go sit in the corner cross your arms and say i paid for a ticket this is unfair i paid for a safe trip uh, I'm, I'm not going to degrade myself to go and get my hands dirty to go build some life rafts i paid for a safe trip therefore the unfairness of it all warrants that uh, i don't have to stoop to that level well you can either be one or two. AfriForum and uh, the Solidarity Movement chooses to be the the, the former, where we're going to get our hands dirty and build those life rafts, even uh, under incredibly unfair circumstances. Yes, and, and South Africa, as we keep explaining on this channel, is like the perfect country to do this in. 
Because at the end of the day, it's my belief and the belief of many others that South Africa is sort of 30, 40, 50 years ahead of the rest of the world. I think state decay and the state of the nation state, for the lack of a better term, is at its sort of peak and decline for the most part. If one reads The Sovereign Individual, which is a fantastic book, I would recommend everyone read it. The fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, sort of made it the end of the nation state. But of course, it takes decades or even a century or two to really feel the effects thereof. Thankfully, in South Africa, we live uh, under such a incompetent government that we get to see it before most of the rest of the world. So once again, South Africa could be a pioneer of a stateless society. And it is, in some regards, already that. So speaking of sort of community federalism, I've noticed that you mentioned the smallest unit is not the individual. Mm. No, the, the, the smallest unit is the family, according to uh, uh, all two years. And I assume as well, we I had, a, we had a debate with Ernest Roots on this, and he's like, individual rights, I mean, are, they are important. But uh, if you live in a vacuum, a person of one is not going to do anything mm. or be able to defend themselves or build anything against an opposition who is two or three or 10,000. Yeah. Oh, well, that's the thing is we, we live in this uh, with this misconception that uh, individual freedom should just be the, the be all and end all and that individual by prioritizing an individual freedom, you're maximizing freedom. But uh, I think there's and this Adam Sarutz will be able to give you a very detailed answer here, seeing as he did his PhD on the topic. But the whole idea of freedom has uh, has changed. The definition of freedom has changed. Is the is the heroin addict that has the freedom to inject heroin into his veins really free or is he a slave to his to, to the drug? The old uh, the 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 traditional idea of freedom is that you should not is, is that you are not a slave to your to your urges or to your appetites or not a slave to to any type of a uh, um uh, thing like for example uh, drugs or even a, a literal slave master but when it comes to the modern idea of freedom is just you should be able to smoke what you want that's uh, that's freedom mm. and uh, but to to get to that uh, more specifically to that point when it comes to the the what uh, individual rights versus the the community there's a very important distinction that uh, uh, professor kuis milan actually points out very astutely and he says that the the community actually enables freedom so he uses the example of a, a piano now roman i don't know if you can play piano um if you I can to. i will i'll just use myself so i can't play piano i can't even play mary had a little lamb but if I were to, if you were to give me a piano, you give me a piano for my birthday, and I and it's sitting there in my in my house, I have the freedom to go sit at the piano and hit the keys and do whatever I want, but I can't really play anything. But if, as in a community and in as in a tradition where you are basing your your ideas and your actions and your behavior on decades and decades centuries of uh, ancestor experience and the people that came before you you're reading books about uh, written by people much smarter than you you are able to uh, uh, tap into collective knowledge around you not just your own uh, uh, individual talents and you can learn from the mistakes of uh, your the people around you and also the people that came before you in that model the same way as with that piano where you can only if it's just you playing it you can't really play anything but if you tap into the tradition of piano players that came before you the great tradition of all the great uh, pianists that came before you and you listen to their music you read about them you study them you tap into that bigger group the community the larger tradition suddenly you have the freedom to be able to play whatever you want. Now, if you practice, you can play any piece on the piano that you want by tapping into that bigger picture. That freedom that is enabled by the community and by tradition is not possible just from a, from a position of just the pure individual sitting there in front of the piano. He doesn't have the freedom to play what he wants if he cannot tap into the, the wider tradition and the, the wider community around him. So speaking as an Afrikaner and working for a, a civil rights organization that is based on, not Afrikaner dorm, that's not the right term to use, but, but mm. based around Afrikaners themselves, what sort of cultural traits or heritage are you tapping into to make sure that this decentralized community federalism mm. can happen? Because the Afrikaner has a very long history in South Africa, of course, it uh, 
was here before most other people. It has sustained itself uh, through centuries in South Africa. Are mm. there any points of history or ideas within the Afrikaner community that you are using to make sure that this community federalism is sort of a real thing? Right. No, um, this is actually something that uh, came to the fore through the interviews that I did for the documentary. And that is, if you look at the Afrikaners history, we have a, a history of uh, this type of federal idea in this sense. So look at the Great Trek. What happened with the Great Trek? Did all the Afrikaners just go coalesce and live in one big central state? Or did the opposite happen? They created dozens of little republics, dozens of little uh, nations, basically, do dozens of little uh, uh, centers of authority. They didn't just go create one nation. They went and as they trekked, they created all these little republics, all these, some of them very small, some of them as large as the, the uh, ZAR. So you have a, a tradition of this federal idea of not just one big central state, but rather a, a decentralized uh, way of, of, uh, of living. You see this on a, on a more simplistic scale as well between the, the Orange Free State and the, the Transvaal. So you have these two republics, they're both Boer republics, but they have their own rules, they have their own laws, they have their own way of doing things, they have their own culture, even if you look into the real nuances of it. And that's the difference. That why didn't they why didn't they just build one big republic? Because they want these nuances are important and they 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 uh, enable a lot more uh, a lot more possibilities and uh, prosperity through uh, through the implementation. So when it comes to the Afrikaners' history, we only really uh, became statists in the the twentieth century with uh, with uh, the unification of South Africa in nineteen ten. The British created the super state called South Africa, and uh, the the Afrikaner nationalists just took it over, and they became statists and state builders, as uh, Prof Milani uh, calls them. And uh, we built a powerful state, but uh, in the end. Uh, as with any uh, centralist project, as with any statist project, in the end, what happens is you you uh, delegate more and more responsibilities to the state. So now suddenly the state uh, is responsible for uh, your safety, for uh, preserving your language, for uh, uh, building uh, museums and uh, universities as well. The universities were put under the state's control during the, the, the Afrikaner nationalist rule. And now what happens when you lose control of that state? Suddenly, that entire state apparatus is gone. You no longer can use it. And it has actually, in many cases, become openly uh, uh, antagonistic towards you. And it's targeting you with discriminatory laws, uh, targeting your language, excluding your language from those very university campuses that you first built through private initiative, but then gave over to the state. And now that the state is in different hands, now suddenly those those campuses like for example Stellenbosch you have cases now of students not even being allowed to speak Afrikaans in private in residences I mean that's that's the end point and that's the hard lesson that Afrikaners had to learn in the previous century that when you are in control of the state and in control of the the centralized state leviathan then you then uh, uh, a lot of things are going your way a lot of things are very easy you don't have to worry about safety you don't have to worry about pres preserving your language you don't have to worry about universities let the government handle that until the day that uh, you lose control over that leviathan and now you have to reinvent the wheel from the beginning which is not an ideal situation that's where we're currently now we have to reinvent the wheel um so we have to go back to val pre 20th century values and maybe a little bit early 20th century values with, for example, the self uh movement within the Afrikaner culture, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the type of movement where communities organize to take their destinies into their own hands. But statism makes you soft. Uh, uh, thinking that if only we are in control of the state Leviathan, everything's going to be fine. It's going to be fine for maybe one or two generations, but uh, you're condemning your generations after you to uselessness to to a point where they're going to have to learn lessons or they have to learn solutions to problems that they even that they forgot existed because the state took care of those problems you didn't even yeah. have to think about them yeah so i was going to an interview with uh, michael yordan who's an africana mm. ex ceo of fmb one of those traitorous africanas who stayed in the cape who didn't uh, do the great trick i'm just mm. joking michael if you are watching this but <clears throat> here's someone worth you know 
at least a hundred million dollars, someone who's got a lot of money and and he has a sort of same mindset as you. He's more like techie orientated. He says the great thing mm. about globalism, ironically, is that the IP or the creation of something could happen in China or America or wherever the case might be, but the use case could be for South Africa. So you have globalism on one side, which I'm not a fan of, but I don't think you are either. But that globalism is very useful to your community federalism because the, the tech needed and the tech built around it makes your federalism a lot easier from solar mm. panels to inverters to filtration systems to whatever you want. South Africa has a very low base of manufacturing and ingenuity in those aspects. So how do you feel about that sort of conundrum where you got globalism on one side that does help you create order within the stateless society? It's almost like a misnomer. It's ironic, but it helps yeah. you very much. Well, the Roman, if my enemy invents gunpowder, that's not going to stop me from taking up a, from uh, supplying my uh, my military with with uh, with firearms. <laughs> that's, uh, that's you use the you use the tools of your time. You don't have to become a globalist to you to benefit from the great technology that comes from globalism. Um, I mean, the, the internet's a great example. We can have this conversation through uh, uh, telecommunication technology that was made possible through uh, the globalization of the world. We are we, the internet. I think is one of the primary examples of a uh, global infrastructure, and uh, we can use it for for these types of conversations. So, absolutely, don't. Uh, don't uh, look a gift horse in the mouth. Use the uh, use the the tools that are at your disposal. Your opponents are using those tools. You can use them as well, as long as they don't degrade your soul. As long as those those tools don't uh, also ask something of you in return that uh, actually is a part of your soul. As that great um, Bible verse of what does it uh, profit a man if he were to gain the whole world or globe, but to uh, uh, lose his soul in the process. I mean, that's the type of uh, cost-benefit analysis that you're going to have to make. What is the cost of everything that you get? What's the cost of convenience? What's the cost of uh, comfort? And that's actually, I had a chat on my channel with um, US Stradom from Urania uh, just uh, uh, this week or last week now. And uh, he's also in the documentary. We uh, we talk about uh, uh, Urania specifically in the documentary as well as one model of decentralized order. And... Um, me and you have, uh, have actually had a great conversation about not just what Urania is, but I made the point in that conversation that we have to start stigmatizing this this in, this constant chasing of just comfort, this constant chasing of just uh, uh, um, uh, in Afrikaans it would be geriflikheid, you know, in, in English it would be a convenience. The, the constant chasing of convenience should be something that's stigmatized, not something that should be celebrated. Convenience is uh, is ultimately, I've realized now, one of the, the devil's fav favorite temptation tools. That's how we got to a lot of the messes and crises that we are in right now, is convenience. And that brings it back to that uh, previous point that I made when we were talking about the state, the allure of the Leviathan that tells you don't worry about safety. Don't worry about schools. Don't worry about your culture. Don't worry about your language. I'll take care of it. You go sit at home, crack open a beer. Your big responsibility is every few years you have to go draw a little cross on a piece of paper, a little uh, do a little voting thing, go stand for 15 minutes in a line, and then your responsibility towards your community is done. I'll I'll handle the I'll handle the safety. I'll handle the culture. I'll handle the schools. I'll even handle the churches if you want. You go sit at home, go relax, crack open a beer, write some poetry, go go paint something, write a, write a novel, go do what you want, go uh, go inject some drugs into your into your system, go enjoy yourself while I handle the these big responsibilities. You don't have to do that. That's what the state how well in this sense that's what the devil says as well. But the state and the devil are very close to each other. Yeah. So yeah, what you what you get. It by the way. No, I just wanted to say what you get here is this allure, this allure of convenience, the allure of comfort. It's like, give, give me all of these responsibilities and you can have comfort, comfort and convenience. Isn't that a great deal? It is a great thing. And one of the problems with the internet is, is that I think a lot of South Africans look at things on the internet, like on some satanic app like TikTok, and they look at what content people are creating, like they're dancing and here's my new Tesla and here's my DoorDash order or whatever the case might be. And they're like, you know, I want that. You know, we should go to England, live in that weather for some reason, but it will be safe. You know, we, we can, it's so convenient. And dopamine is like the worst drug of the 21st century. It's like the biggest drug 
addiction that we have at the moment. But there's a certain mindset you need to have. I saw excuse me, I saw statistics that you know fifty percent of graduates wish to emigrate. Some of them are Afrikaners, some of them are English, some of them are Zulus or Khazars or whatever the fact might be. And that sort of mindset can't really live in South Africa. So how, how do you maybe entice people not to immigrate, mm. perhaps, not to <laughs> seek convenience, but to like stay and build? Because I think it's yeah. an important factor for Afri Forum success. And also, mm. we need the skills here to have this federalized communal aspect of what you wish mm. to achieve. Mm. Well, Roman, uh, you and I had a great chat on my channel about this very question. And for if people want to really get into the in-depth on this, I recommend they go check it out. It's on my channel, Conscious Caracal. The, the, the episode is called, Why Don't You Just Immigrate? And you can just search on YouTube, Why Don't You Just Immigrate? Roman Kabanak. And there's a very hour long, more than an hour long conversation that me and Roman had on the topic. But to, to answer briefly, you really have to start asking yourself the question, uh, what are the costs of, of moving and what are the costs of uh, digging a trench? I had a conversation with Oren McIntyre on his channel a, a, a month ago or so, and we were talking about a controversy that was actually going on in England in their intellectual circles where uh, Peter Hitchens, the brother of Christopher Hitchens, was basically saying that uh, young Englishmen have no future in England and they need to immigrate. And then uh, some other intellectuals within their sphere took him on and said, no, we have to fight for what's going on, for what's important and what needs to be preserved. But that aside, so then Oren uh, invites me to have a chat on this immigration question, seeing as, the, I mean, there's no two ways about it, the Afrikaner and South Africa, in South Africa, uh, the immigration question is always on the forefront. Uh, it's always in the, in the front of people's minds. Um, and I, I just opened that interview with the, the remark that do you know how deeply ironic it is to hear you ask me what my opinion is on these Brits debating whether they should immigrate away from Britain. And I come from the country that probably has one of the biggest uh, uh, South Africa, one of the main places where South Africans immigrate is Britain. <laughs> but like, don't you see the strange, uh, the strange dynamic going on there? Uh, young Britons are, are debating whether they should leave and young South Africans just can't wait to get to Britain. But anyway, to, to add to that, uh, to get back to that point of the cost, you really need to ask yourself, are you moving for material uh, reasons? I mean, safety, uh, opportunities for your children, opportunities for yourself. These are things that are valid. These aren't things that people should be shamed for, for leaving, for, for, for immigrating for. Oh, but great. there are other reasons for staying that aren't mentioned so, so often, but also costs to moving that aren't mentioned so often. So one of those costs, speaking as an Afrikaner, it's very easy to, to demonstrate this point. Some other groups are not as uh, uh, as uh, as preoccupied with preserving their culture, but uh, Afrikaners are Afrikaner. They I want there to be in a hundred years still Afrikaners. I want there still to be Afrikaners in a thousand years. But if Afrikaners don't have a future in Africa, then our culture doesn't have a future. It's not possible. We are very disposed and, and open to assimilation. We don't have any cultural defensive mechanisms against assimilation. Other cultures do. There are some cultures that if they immigrate into America or to England or whatever, they build their own communities and they only, they're only allowed to marry each other. They're not allowed to assimilate in any way. They speak their language. They open and build their own churches, everything. They're very uh isolationist also or in that sense but afrikaners don't have that the story with afrikaners is always the same we go to a host country and we are very polite towards our hosts a good immigrant assimilates that's our stance i mean that's to a certain extent i can understand that you are being hosted by that country um but the thing is we assimilate very quickly and very easily and what that means is that within one or two at the most three generations, any Afrikaner immigrants will be Canadians, Australians, Americans, New Zealanders. They will no longer see themselves as Afrikaners. They will have no connection to our culture. They will have no connection to the broader uh, Afrikaner culture. That's just a reality. It's not, I don't, uh, like I said, immigrating is a very deeply personal choice it's something you and your family decide it's not something i can tell you to, sh to do it or not do it it's not something that i can be prescriptive about that's your deep 
personal decision. And you and people that have chosen to immigrate and people that have chosen to stay have their own deep reasons for doing it. And I completely understand that. The only but the only way for these two groups to have a constructive conversation with each other is by being frank, not just about the costs of staying, but also the costs of leaving. I mean, the costs of staying, uh, where, how do you count the ways? I mean, I can sit here and list the costs of staying, the material costs in regards to crime, racial discrimination from the government, destruction and the collapse of infrastructure. I mean, th there's no shying away from li listing all the costs of staying behind. But when we start talking about the costs of immigrating or leaving, suddenly the conversation gets very awkward. Suddenly it gets uncomfortable. Suddenly people start shifting in their, in their seats and they want to change the subject. The only way that we can have a constructive conversation about whether to move or whether to dig a trench is if we can talk frankly about the costs of staying and the costs of leaving. The costs of staying are very highly material. The costs of leaving, the benefits of leaving are very material, but the costs of leaving are very spiritual and, and you can't put a, a, a monetary value on it. And I think we, we get into that very, uh, very thoroughly in that chat of ours. So that's why I, 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 uh, I shilled it because I think people will actually enjoy that very much if this topic interests them. But yeah, just to finish off. The only way that these conversations about immigration, I know it's a thorny topic in South Africa, but the only way it becomes non thorny is if we just speak frankly about both sides, about the costs of staying and the costs of leaving, the benefits of leaving and the benefits of staying. Those four, you need to be able to talk honestly and frankly and directly about all four of those elements, then you can have a constructive conversation. So I think quite a few of my viewers are, are sort of Anglos, uh, quite a few Afrikaners as well. I would assume most are conservative, liberal, classically liberal. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. it's a classical liberal, like this this notion, and I'm just speaking in general terms, not to, to anyone directly who is a subscriber. Right. People, right. I think classically liberals are generally utilitarian, right? Mm. When they look at costs, it's, it's mostly material costs, mostly... Mm -hmm material benefits like safety like healthcare like uh, electricity like money things like that when you say the spiritual costs are very high for you mm. it, i don't think that will reflect well or or, or be something that yeah. is widely understood for especially anglo liberals okay Understand? well Not uh, I, I, I get your i get your your question is how, you how do you reach that how do you reach these people well, well how would you explain it's very... that metaphysical yeah. cost that you speak yeah. about Absolutely. So that's the other aspect of it. Like I said, I wish we had a, a two hours to speak about just this topic. But here's the here's the gist of it. Here's the uh, the essence of this uh, answer to this question. The problem with the the globalized world that we live in is the idea that comes with it that uh, the world is your oyster. You can live wherever you want. You just go where the prosperity is. You just go where the safety is. But as Russell Lamberti, friend of both ours, uh, has said. The problem is if you can live anywhere, you often forget to live somewhere. And I think he's got a very important point there. You end up forgetting where, where home is, where, where, what are you willing to stand to defend? So let's take, for example, our time. We live in the time of mobile work, working from home. We live in a, I mean, uh, you're, you've definitely seen it happen in your friend circles and in the, your community around you as well. People are moving to small, beautiful towns where they can work from home. They don't have to work from the office in Johannesburg anymore. They can go to Parel or Hermanus or Naisna, any beautiful little, uh, even smaller little Karua towns anywhere. And they can work from home and they can enjoy their nice, uh, beautiful, traditional community, uh, postcard, picturesque view whether it's in the Drakensbergs or what, at the beach, whatever. And yet, I'm not just talking about South Africa. I just use some South African examples because it hits close to home. But people all across the world are doing this, specifically in Europe. They're going away from the cities and they're going to live in small little towns working from, from home. But this, this, this creates a conundrum. And this I'm going to bring it back to immigration in this way. The conundrum that it creates is that you're fleeing to places that are beautiful and safe and aesthetic and lovely to live in because people have been living there and building there and loving those places for generations through thick and thin, through depressions, through prosper prosperous times, through wars, through famines. People have been living in those little towns 
for generations and they've been sacrificing and building to make those places as beautiful and peaceful and amazing as they are. And all these prosperity uh, nomads are moving to those places and are picking the fruits of those intergenerational sacrifices and being completely oblivious to how these beautiful places that they go, that they moved to became how they were. And the problem, and this is the same problem that immigration has, not just as a South African in the global context, you can't just keep fleeing to higher ground as the water rises, because in the end, you're going to reach a point where there's no higher ground left. There's the water is just going to keep rising unless you start building dams, unless you start fighting the rising tide, you're going to continue fleeing until there's no higher ground left until the very last beautiful little town also just becomes an urban industrialized hellscape ridden with crime and degeneracy and just all these horrible things. That's the future that you're building through just moving from one prosperous place to the next. And you have to, and the question, the hard question that you have to ask is that the people that flee from places that are falling apart to places that work, are they, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. There are very valid reasons, as uh, Russell Lamberti has said, if your position has become lost, you should move to a place that is much e is easier to defend. But at the same time, are you willing to move to a different place? And then when the same problems arise there, willing to stand up and fight them, or are you are just going to move again? Because that's where the Im immoral aspect comes in. I don't, I don't have a problem with moving once from a place that is definitely a lost position. Like, for example, if you live in some small town in rural South Africa, infrastructure is completely collapsed. There's nothing left there. And you move to, a, a for example, a, a more developed town a, or a more defensible position, that's fine. But are you willing to then defend that place or are you just going to move again uh, when the same problems ari arise there? That's, that's where the crux of it comes in. The, unfortunately, I get the idea that the majority of people will just move again. They will, when the same problems arise, they will move to point C. When the problems arise in point C, they will move to point D. When the problems arise in point D, ad infinitum, until they reach point Z. What happens when you reach point Z? Well, there's nowhere left to flee and everyone is crowding around each other in this one little peak above the, the flood waters. Then it's too late. Then there's nothing you can do. You're not going to salvage that situation. You can't beat back the waters when they completely engulf the entire world. So the only, and to, to, uh, to end off, there, there isn't a, a absolute yes or no answer in whether to stay or move. You, that's a decision you're going to have to make yourself. And it's definitely, uh, it's definitely going to be determined by your circumstances. It isn't always going to be you have to stay and it's not always going to be you have to leave. It's whether you, you have to decide, are you going to move or are you are going to dig a trench? I think a lot of people, a lot of people listening to your show specifically are in positions where they can dig a trench rather than move. Some of them might be in situations where there's not, it's not possible to dig a trench anymore. It's the, the position has been lost. Then there's, then there's an argument to move. But if there's the opportunity to build, the opportunity to salvage, the opportunity to preserve, then you should be fighting. And you should be asking yourself that question. If you have already moved, that's the, the last thing. If you have already moved, you need to now say, well, I've moved, but if I move again, I'm going into the realm of immorality. Now I'm just a prosperity nomad. Now I'm going from place to place, and as things get worse, I'm just uh, leaving it behind, leaving the other people that don't have the luxury to move to suffer. So you have to ask yourself that question if you've already moved. Are you willing to defend this new place that you've moved to? There the, the question becomes less of 50-50. There it becomes like, I think you have a duty, especially if you've already moved to a more defensible place. You now have a duty to defend that place, not to move again. The more times you move away from the problems, the more immoral you become in, 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 in this sense. I think that's quite a good metaphor. Uh, unfortunately, I have to be on my way. Um, but yeah. Anas, I think your, your, your metaphor about the, the tide is rising and the easiest way to make sure you negate that is to build a trench. If we use it in a global sense, the tide is rising all over the world, thanks to inflation, thanks to the Russian war uh, in Ukraine, thanks to migration in the EU, thanks to a variety of things. It's easier to build a trench in South Africa than almost anywhere else, I would suspect, which is why 
people should stay here and build a trench here because it is, as I said, the pioneering state for everyone else in time to come. Is that fair? Oh, no, absolutely. And it, uh, I mean, that connects to that. Uh, that's the, the, the idea of, are you occupying a defensible position? I think in South Africa, communities of, uh, occupy very defensible positions. Mm. You know who does not occupy defensible positions? Communities in America that can get way code. Those, are, those, the, those aren't defensible positions. When you have a massive, hyper-competent, uh, compared to South Africa and the rest of the world, massively militarily strong state, the, 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 the position is not lost, but it's go, you're going to have to think of very creative and uh, very determined ways of defending your position there. In South Africa, the state, one last example to maybe send it to really bring it home is that let's take for example the idea of commu uh, uh, neighborhood watches do you really think the anc in an ideal world would want neighborhood watches in south africa of course not they would want saps and the police service to have a complete ironclad monopoly on violence and on uh, enforcing the law and on uh, law and order but they don't have that luxury. They don't live, they've created this, their own circumstances where it's impossible for them to stop neighborhood watches from being created and thriving and keeping their community safe. That's what happened in COVID. Becky Chele said, you're not allowed to, to have neighborhood watches during lockdown. And neighborhood watches said, we have to keep our community safe. Sorry, what are you gonna do about it? Yeah, not much. Ernest, thank you so much. For anyone who is considering looking at what answers have been given you can look at Aaron's documentary down in the description as well his as well as his twitter handle and a variety of other sources for Aaron's. Aaron's, thank you once again for being on the show thank you for doing what you do and as always if you like morning shots you should definitely be paying afri for him because that's how capitalism works i suppose <laughs> all the best all right thank you. cheers roman cheers <laughs>